Welcome to the first video in this two-part video series about Amazon Manage Blockchain's Hyperledger Fabric service. In this video, you will learn about the Amazon Manage Blockchain service, the difference between public and private blockchain networks, the fundamentals of Hyperledger Fabric, and use cases for Amazon Manage Blockchain's Hyperledger Fabric offering. My name is Varsha Narmit, and I'm a solutions architect specializing in Web3 and blockchain technologies here at AWS. A basic comprehension of blockchain concepts is the only prerequisite needed. No additional experience is required as I will walk you through on why one might want to create a Hyperledger Fabric network and how it would be beneficial. So let's dive in. Now let's go over the concept of public and private blockchains and how they differ. Public blockchains are permissionless networks, meaning that anyone can interact with the blockchain network. To help illustrate the difference between public and private blockchain networks, let's start, first start with public blockchains and something you've likely heard about as well, tokens. Tokens are digital representations of assets. Now let's explore the different types of tokens. So these could be non-fungible tokens, NFTs, or fungible tokens. Let's also just take a quick moment to talk about what exactly NFTs and fungible tokens are. So NFTs are blockchain-based tokens that each represent unique assets, like a piece of art, digital content, or media while fungible tokens are assets that are divisible and non-unique. But if you're issuing these digital tokens to prove ownership over some assets, and particularly if you're planning on making these tokens available on the open market to be tradable, it ideally should be accessible by the public and therefore you would use a public blockchain network. So let me show you how this would work. So let's assume that we have this blockchain network and it'll all be interconnected. All the nodes in this network would be interconnected because this is a blockchain network and uh, blockchain networks are decentralized networks. And now if I go back to that token example I was talking about, you want to make sure that in order for these tokens to be tradable in the open market, the nodes in the blockchain network need to be able to interact with other nodes without needing to receive permission to join. So I'll show how that would work. So let's say we have this node and we want this node to be able to easily interact with the nodes in this blockchain network. However, with private and enterprise blockchain networks, you need some sort of trust between all the members in your network because these networks tend to offer more advanced privacy features and should be able to support higher transaction rates than are typically possible with public blockchains. They could be a good option for when enterprises need the practical benefits of decentralization but they don't wish to expose their data to the public. More specifically, organizations can achieve higher visibility between all the entities within their network, but they don't want members outside of their blockchain network to have any visibility. So let me give you an example to help make this concept easier to understand. Um, and so let's take something that's more relevant today, such as digital battery passports that are being mandated in the European Union. So again, uh, let's go back to that same blockchain network. And again, we can have four members um, and each one of these members can be uh, your stakeholders. Um, in this case, we'll store all the information about the device's carbon footprint, safety certification, and supply chain due diligence, among other metrics in your ledger. We also want to make sure that uh, sustainable practices are followed when creating these batteries. And 
We also want to make sure exactly where these materials are coming from to eliminate practices such as child labor. So traditionally, if we didn't have this kind of decentralized network, what we would have is we would have all of these stakeholders, they would be their own, um, on their own. And then you would have some sort of central authority, which would be monitoring everything that's going on. And each one of these stakeholders, in order to communicate to each other, they would have to um, pass paperwork back and forth, which all of this could take a long time and a lot of energy uh, that's unnecessary if we opt for a decentralized network such as blockchain. So the main point of private or enterprise blockchain networks are you want to utilize these to utilize the decentralization aspect. Um, however, if you don't want to compromise on your security and you don't want other members to be able to look into your network uh, to see any information, you would want to use a private blockchain network. So in my previous example, um, I was talking about how in a public blockchain network, another node can easily interact with the nodes in the blockchain network. However, with a private blockchain network, outside members wouldn't be able to look in to the blockchain network. And a decentralized approach is essential because it makes traceability easier, helps preserve sensitive corporate information, such as names of suppliers and prevent collision in involving a centralized player. Moreover, by creating an open and interoperable standard, it can prevent single points of failure. So that's just a little bit about public and private blockchains and how they differ from each other. Uh, however, they still are able to use the decentralization aspect of blockchain. Now that we've talked about public and private blockchain networks and their differences, moving onwards, I'll be focusing on private blockchains. So now that I explained what public, private, and enterprise blockchains are, I'll explain to you what some of the biggest challenges of creating blockchain solutions are and what you can do to combat those challenges. To begin with, blockchain networks can be very hard to set up. And blockchain networks require you to stitch up a lot of infrastructure together, which requires a lot of manual effort to configure things securely and efficiently. It's also hard to scale. And as your network grows, this just gets harder and harder to maintain because it just means you have more and more infrastructure to keep track of. Moving on, manage, managing these blockchain networks can also be very complicated, especially when it comes to managing security, governance, data, and billing. And this will just get more and more cumbersome as you scale. And because it's hard to scale, manage, and create, as you can imagine, it can get pretty expensive to create these blockchain networks. So to kind of combat these challenges, I would like to take a moment to talk about the Amazon Managed Blockchain service. Amazon Managed Blockchain makes it easy for you to be able to create and manage scalable blockchain networks using popular open source networks. And two of the most popular networks that we support with Amazon Managed Blockchain are Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum. Ethereum is our public blockchain network and Hyperledger Fabric is our private blockchain network. Now I'd like to talk about some of the main benefits from using our Amazon Managed Blockchain service. First off, it's a fully managed service, which means that it'll only take a matter of minutes to set it up versus hours or days through a console, CloudFormation, or CLI. It's also based on our popular open source projects with added management features, 
And our console and APIs make it easier to manage the governance features of blockchain. And Amazon Managed Blockchain is architected with AWS's robust services and technologies for reliability and scalability. And again, because it's a fully managed service, just like a lot of our other managed services, it follows a pay-as-you-go pricing model, and that way you can keep your costs low. And lastly, if you're already using our other AWS services, Amazon Managed Blockchain is a great option because it's tightly integrated with all of our other AWS services. Lastly, I'd like to take a moment to go over an example architecture for a Hyperledger Fabric blockchain network where two government agencies are interacting with a blockchain network. And before moving on, I want to explain how these transactions are being made and agreed upon. So anytime a transaction gets created on a node, the order that you see there will be notified and the transaction will be sent to all of the other nodes in the network. By that, I mean not only all the nodes within the same member, but all of the nodes and all of the other members as well. However, anytime these transactions do get dispersed, you would need to reach some sort of consensus amongst all of the other nodes and members. Furthermore, I'd like to say that to add more members to your network, you would have to create proposals and all of the other members in your network can decide to vote for or against allowing a new member into your blockchain network. And lastly, if you create a Hyperledger Fabric network, your organization will automatically be the first member of that network. So that'll be all for this video. And come join us in the next video where I'll be doing a demo where I create a Hyperledger Fabric network. Thank you.